Bill Bender, are you feeling the anticipation, the energy beginning to build in our circuit of college football? How are you, my friend? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. And, yeah, it's, it's, we're close. Um, you know, I think uh, I could do without the week zero, though. I'd, I'd prefer they all played on the same week. It, that's like kind of like Christmas that first week. What is? It is, but it gives us a little appetizer. It's like going to a steakhouse when you're really, really hungry and you bring out that bread and it's just some kind of butter and some kind of bread and it just gets you to the real main ribeye or filet or uh, sirloin or whatever you're, whatever you're aiming for. It just kind of gets you there. It's that little appetizer that'll get us to the real college football games. Yeah, we've got a pretty good one this year. I mean, Florida, Miami. I mean, obviously, Miami's been in the headlines this week because of the Tate Martell thing where. I think people are piling on him a little bit too much. I mean, he's a kid, quarterback. He didn't win a starting job. I don't know that. And I get his personality, and I get the social media aspect of it. But uh, they're going to have to have good quarterback play against Florida. I think the Gators are uh, favored by Sean in that game. Should be fun. Should be a barometer to see where they're going in year two with Dan Mullen. What do you expect? from those guys when, when you look at the Gators I mean do you think they're ready to compete for the SEC East yeah I don't know if they're ready to compete for a national championship yet I mean they, they were in the neighborhood with, with uh Georgia last year they're not quite there I mean Kirby's got a nice head start in terms of recruiting and and where that program's at but I think Florida I don't know I'd ask you the same question I mean after Alabama and Georgia, who's next? I mean, who would you take the next three years? I might, I would personally take A and M because I like their setup, I like their recruiting base, I like what Jimbo can do on the recruiting trail. Somebody else might say LSU, somebody might play, say Florida. I'd, I'd be curious to hear what your answer is. Well, I, I look at LSU. Just something about this team. I'm buying the hype, Bill. I don't know why. I can't. I, I'm not able to justify it because every year we're hearing. You know, they're going to open it up. Their offense is going to open it up. They're going to go back to, you know, maybe trying to find a way to throw the football a little bit and try to have some success. And, uh, you know, but, I, but I'm buying LSU for some reason. I don't know why. I can't even really justify it other than just a gut instinct. And I think LSU may be uh, that third best team. And, you know, there's a lot of talk coming out of Baton Rouge that if they come to Tuscaloosa undefeated, their only loss is to Alabama. They can try to find a way to keep it respectable here. Uh, that they're th- they're talking college football playoff down there. Yeah, and I can see that. That that's an interesting scenario for them. But they've got to win the rest of them around. Them. And uh, you know, I-, I think they're interesting. You know, I, I like A and M where they're at with Kellen Mond and, and the quarterback. And the- well, like I said, the way Jimbo recruits, he he's recruited enough talent to win a national championship before, and he can do it again. So. But I think uh, you know this circles back to your original point about Florida. I think Dan Mullen's done a nice job. Yeah, especially with Felipe Franks. That's a program that's feeling a lot better about itself after a four-win season the year before. But I almost think set the bar a little too high too fast. And there's a danger in that because if they go 9-4 and four for some reason this year and Great lose point. a couple of those crossover games, th- then where do you go from there? Well, it's, a, it's an excellent point because you almost think about that with, with Georgia for just a minute. Like, right now, they didn't bring Kirby Smart in to win SEC championships. They, they brought Kirby Smart in to get them to the national championship conversation. And and you almost wonder, okay, he gets them there. Let's say that he goes through the SEC East. He makes it to Atlanta. Alabama goes to Atlanta. They thump Georgia again. Then you're sitting there going, okay, when are they ever going to get over this hump? When are they ever going to get over this hump? I mean, as a Georgia fan, they're looking at it and trying to overanalyze it because they, they just fired a coach that averaged 10 wins a season. Uh, they had a a coach that could do that. They're looking for more than just 10 wins. Yeah, they're looking for national titles. I mean, another program, to me, when you get it, and we're seeing all the lists now of great programs and great traditions and great things about college football and all of them. I mean, I click on most of them. That's that's fun to read. Sure. Uh, To me, Ryan, Georgia's kind of the – we're doing the blood test for programs. And then bear with me for a second. I think they're the – Blue blood program, the one that you know gets on the montage all the time, that's on the clock as far as winning the national title. I mean, Penn State's was eighty six, Notre Dame's eighty eight, Michigan's ninety seven. They all have pronounced your alps too, but to be all the way back to nineteen eighty. After you get through them, you know you're talking about programs that have waited forty years or more, and that's why I think the urgency there, and it becomes a little bit psychological, the more swings you get when you lose. 
No, I, I agree. I mean, because I go back, and we've talked about this several times this offseason with you, Bill, but it's like Kirby Smart, you get Nick Saban on the ground, how many opportunities are you going to have to have Nick Saban beat the way that Georgia had Alabama beat twice in the same calendar year, and you let a backup quarterback come off the bench and beat you? That's crazy yeah, I mean, talk. Yeah, last year sticks out to me, so I always tell a story. You know, I was at the Big Ten Championship game last year, or – listening to the first half on the radio, getting the press box, and in the third quarter, what, were they down 10 at that point, maybe 14? Um, there was never a point in that game where I thought Alabama was going to lose. And it's crazy to say that, knowing that, you know, once they got rolling and Jalen turned it on, it, the the thing that Kirby did, and, and again, this is where I think it becomes psychological, it, goes, it circles back to that fake punt. You know, that's when you know Alabama's in your head, when you're doing something uncharacteristic. Now, if it works, Kirby Smart took the greatest gamble ever, but it didn't work. And again, like you said, you only get so many chances to win a national championship. I guess one difference with Clemson is they've taken advantage of their opportunity, and Dabo's taken advantage of just about every opportunity they've had on the big stage. All right, so let's go to worst-case scenario for Alabama. You wrote best-case and worst-case scenario earlier this week, sportingnews.com. We're talking to Bill Bender uh, that you can read all of his work as we pile up college football, and it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet right there, sportingnews.com. Best-case and worst-case scenario for Alabama. Let's start with the best-case scenario, in your opinion. Oh, it's the one you guys like, another national title. He, you know, They carry Saban off like they did Bear. Um undefeated season, go through. Who did we have not beaten in the semifinal? Zach and I were arguing about that. I said it should be like Ohio State or Michigan. He was saying Oklahoma. So I don't I don't remember who we yeah, ended up Yeah, Alabama settling. gets Ohio State in the semifinal. Ryan Day's season, uh, season number one, ends before that revenge game. You got Clemson, Alabama in the finals. Yeah, and then I think you get that one, and then you win sure. there, and, and Nick gets carried off the field. Like Bear. Um, in the Sugar yeah, Bowl. I mean, in, in the Sugar Bowl, which is the last place that Coach Bryant won a national title. It would be more than apropos in a lot of ways if that were to happen. Now, uh, you know, and obviously it would pass the Bear. I think that's the story we would all write. You know, when you and I have our lunch on that Friday when I fly into town, we'd probably be talking about that storyline, I'm sure. So I think that's the best case scenario for Alabama, which there's only, I think, on that top 25, I think there's only five or six where we gave them, you know, the best case is you win it all. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario for Bill Bender for Alabama in 2019. Didn't I mirror it on 2010 where yes, sir, you, you did. South Carolina somehow? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Uh, the, that is the only – I think this is correct. I think that's the only road venue in the SEC where Saban hasn't won at Alabama. And it's because of lack of opportunity. Um You know, they played the one time down there, and Stephen Garcia had a game. I don't have to go any further. But, you know, it would mirror that. You lose to LSU later in the season. Then you lose to Auburn, and it's a three-loss season. And then all of a sudden, the overreactions are off the charts. Now, do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. But it is fun to do that. I have more fun with that article than most of the ones I do in the preseason because it's fun to kind of look at what the pressure points would be for a worst-case scenario for some programs. I mean, you think about it, though, right? I mean, Alabama's at a point where the worst case is three losses. I think Clemson and them, maybe Georgia, are the only programs in the country where that's the worst case scenario, where you would lose three games. Save this paragraph. You might need it next year. Because I think I think next year could be a challenge for Alabama. I mean, we're not going to talk about 2020 yet, but there's a lot of reasons to believe. Like, if you were making this case August of 2020, like, I can almost buy it. Like, there, there's a schedule out there that looks nasty for Alabama in 2020. I mean, it, it's a it's a, it's a a bear when you talk about uh, no no pun intended. You get to November, you got to go through. If you're going to get to the SEC and, and win the SEC, you'll have to go through LSU, Auburn, excuse me, uh, LSU, Texas A&M, Auburn, and then you'll have to beat the SEC East champ, probably Georgia, maybe Florida, to be able to win and be in college football playoffs. Uh, You start with USC. You got Georgia coming here. Uh, Everybody's picking on this 2019 schedule. I guess they they, they took a wrong and made it a right in 2020 because this 2020 schedule looks like a multiple loss season with with losing all the players. Is that Urban Meyer at USC in the opener too? 
<laughs> I, no, 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 no. I mean, think about it. I mean, it is. It, it, it'll, it'll be a, probably a new coach, and you're going to be starting probably a new quarterback, and you may lose up to 16 and 17 starters out of the starting 22 here in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that that maybe that's the year. I mean, the A&M before Auburn, that was a, a touch I'm sure you guys were thrilled about on that schedule. But, I mean, it, it other teams have survived that gauntlet, and, and Alabama's still built through recruiting to do that. And you don't know where – nobody knows where Auburn's going to be at that point. LSU sure. will have a new quarterback. That's what I'm telling you. A&M, the opportunity's there for them to, to maybe challenge Alabama a little bit. I'm not going to overtake them, but – and maybe that's me putting – I don't know. You you can make fun of me if you want, Ryan. I've known you long enough. I mean, I I I, I uh, am I putting too much faith in Jimbo? You tell me. I like Jimbo. I really do. I, I'm I'm a huge fan of him. He comes from the Saban system. He understands. Uh, and I talked with him after Alabama beat Georgia inside the dome, and I asked him, you know, when Nick Saban taught, you know, tied Coach Paul Bear Bryant. I asked him a couple of questions on record, and you know, got him to talk about you know Alabama. And, I said, what's the first thing that goes through your mind when you see Alabama? He said, I've got to go recruit. I've got to, I've got to recruit. If I'm going to compete with Alabama in the SEC West, i got to build my roster. He's doing that. He's doing that. And, and, and it's a natural recruiting base. Uh, I like Jimbo out there. I mean, I really do. I mean, I think, I think that may be Alabama's future rival. And, and I think the real discussion, and I know I was going to go a different direction, but I think you've opened up a really good one, is where does Auburn fit in in the SEC West? If it's Alabama at one, two is either LSU or Texas A&M, who's that, who's that fourth team? Is it really Auburn? I mean, can they be part of the conversation? They've got to make a move uh, this year to be a part of the conversation and be able to survive and be able to say, hey, no, we're two and three. We're in that conversation. If not, you're going to get pushed down pretty quick. Well, the two Mississippi schools have had hit, hit or miss seasons. Um, I think Mississippi State will be steady with Joe. I don't know if they'll ever be a championship team, but I – I like Joe Moorhead more than others. He's a northerner like me, so of course I like him. Um, you know, but I think they can be an eight-win team consistently in the conference. I think Arkansas is a big season for them to show some movement with Chad. But you're you're exactly right. Auburn's place in the SEC West is interesting to speculate about, especially if it goes south this year. I do think they have one of the best defensive lines in the country, at least the starting unit. Derek Brown, Nick Coe, those guys can play. Uh, we all know the, the kind of formula, though. If they don't have the quarterback play that's efficient, that's able to you know create a threat to run the ball with the quarterback, they can push the ball down the field in the vertical passing game. They don't have, like, two of those things. They normally have at least one. If they don't have two of the three, they're pretty bad sometimes, and they're pretty inconsistent. And I think that's what you got to watch this year. Are they going to be consistent enough on both sides of the ball? And, and, and you know, where Gus is – hot seat is going to be measured with every single game, starting with that Oregon game. It's a tough season. Hey, Bill, I want to take you to a team that you're a lot closer. You understand the climate. We're talking to Bill Bender. Final question. As we look at the article, let me invite people because I think it's really fun to be able to talk about best case and worst case scenarios. I think we're going to make a conversation about it here in T-Town and we'll get the callers involved in a couple of minutes and we'll ask them that same question about Alabama best and worst case scenario. But I want to take you to Notre Dame because as we're talking about this 150th college football and everybody's throwing out, when is Notre Dame coming back? And I'm not talking coming back as in they pretend to be a part of the conversation, then they get to a championship game, they get blown out by this big team. When is Notre Dame going to get back to being Notre Dame? You're going to laugh at me. I think they were better despite the result than they were when they played Alabama in 12. I think the roster was better. They have NFL offensive linemen on that team. I mean, Quentin Nelson is the best offensive lineman in the NFL, at least one of them. So they've done that. I think he's upgraded the recruiting. But I just think from a big game preparation standpoint, they weren't ready for Clemson. They weren't. Trevor Lawrence got hot. They had an injury in the secondary. They don't have the depth through recruiting that Alabama and Clemson are. And I say that in that when Alabama loses a dude like they did this year at linebacker, I know you guys get worried, but you got, got you got a dude behind him that can play. Notre Dame, when they lose a guy in the secondary, sometimes it falls apart. You know, Michigan, sometimes when they lose a defensive end, you know, like over Sean Gary, things can fall apart. That doesn't happen in Alabama because they've got enough depth through what Nick's built that, that it, they can shake it off. Now, don't get me wrong. You guys have had more injuries at linebacker than I any team in the country. Sure, sure. <laughs> And you got another one this year, obviously. And when you lose Trey Sanders, 
it's not, I mean, and I hope he gets back on the field some, you know, next season, but um, it doesn't hurt you guys as much as it hurts the Notre Dame. And I think that's, he's building that. And again, I don't think, I know what the scoreboard said, but a lot of that was Trevor Lawrence and T. Higgins and uh, Justin Ross. Other than that, Notre Dame's roster isn't that far behind. And your, your listeners will laugh at that, but I, I just think they've improved over the last five years. And, and Brian Kelly's done a better job than he's given credit for. All right, I'm going to leave you with this, Bill. You make about 35, 40 radio appearances every single week. You talk college football, 365, 52 weeks out of the year. I don't know anybody makes more radio appearances than you do. But when you talk to him about Alabama, because people always throw you questions of Alabama, I'm going to leave you with this. You can tell him that your buddy in Tuscaloosa, somebody that uh, you've known for quite a few years, thinks this may be the best-looking Alabama team, top to bottom, that I've seen in Tuscaloosa. No, that, that makes it you know terrifying for a lot of other teams. And so, uh, so give them that message, Bill. As you're walking out there and you you walk out in Columbus, Ohio, or uh, maybe it's Ann Arbor, wherever you're making these college football appearances, uh, this team physically passes every eye test that you you can create. It's it's a great looking football team here in T Town. Don't let Nick well, Saban good. hear that, but it's it's true. Well, well that would probably uh, clinch up that I'm going to see uh, down in. in in the bayou in New Orleans in January. And I, I won't argue with that. We I always enjoy our conversations. And I'm sure I'll talk to you a few more times here along the way. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much, no man. Problem, Have a great right? weekend.